What is the counsel of the gods? In Psalm 82 verse 1, we read a very curious statement. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, or the divine counsel. He judgeth among the gods. What in the world does this verse mean? Does it teach us that there are many gods, and the God of the Bible, Yahweh, is just the greatest of them who presides over this council of gods? Or does it refer to angels and teach us that there is a council of angels who rule over the universe along with God? These interpretations sound fantastical and strange, but what else could it mean? Is there another interpretation for this psalm, or are we really to conclude that God does his work on the earth after conferring with a council in heaven about whether it should be done? Well, let's begin by first agreeing that our study of this subject must be centered around the intended interpretation of this passage. We are asking the question, what did Asaph, the human author of this psalm, intend to convey to the people of Israel who would hear it sung in the temple of God? To do that, we'll examine six different interpretive views on this passage and compare them to the information we gather about the intent of the text to see which of these views fit. All right, let's begin with our first view, polytheism. That's a fancy word that simply means many gods. A polytheist believes that there are multiple beings like Yahweh or Jehovah. They would argue that this psalm teaches us that he is part of a family of gods, because the word used for God, capital G, in Psalm 82 is also used for gods, lowercase g. It is the Hebrew word Elohim. Literally, Psalm 82 says, Elohim standeth in the congregation of the El, he judgeth among the Elohim. So, case closed, right? There is a congregation or council of Elohim gods, and Jehovah, Yahweh, stands as the greatest of these Elohim. That's polytheism, isn't it? Well, when we take this verse in isolation, it might sound like polytheism is a fair interpretation, but remember the goal of interpretation. It is to determine the meaning that the author of a text intended to convey to his readers. That means we need to compare the polytheist interpretation of this passage to the intent of the authors. I say authors plural because every passage of scripture has at least two authors, the human penman and the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21 says, Prophecy came not in ancient times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, to think that Asaph, the songwriter, would have intended to convey under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that there was more than one God like Yahweh in heaven is absolutely ridiculous. And if his original audience had thought that he meant to convey that, then his writing would never have been accepted by the people of Israel or placed within their book of Psalms. You see, the people of Israel were told constantly that true worship of Yahweh meant recognizing his exclusivity. He is the only God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 is an example of a passage that was very important to the Israelites. In many of these passages, I'll substitute the Hebrew words for God in place of the English ones. I think this will help us greatly in our discussion. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one Yahweh, and thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Then, in Deuteronomy 32, God said, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no Elohim with or beside me. In fact, when King Solomon dedicated the temple of God, he made this prayer in 1 Kings 8.23. He said, Yahweh Elohi of Israel, there is no Elohim like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath. Furthermore, since Asaph also wrote Psalm 74, which seems to be referring to the time when God cast off his people Israel for a while by sending them into captivity to the Babylonians, we can then guess that Asaph lived and wrote after the time of the captivity, which means he wrote after the time of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote before the Babylonian captivity. Isaiah's writings would have been very important to Asaph and his audience. So it's important to note that Isaiah also wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit 
about the exclusivity of the God of Israel, saying in Isaiah 44, 6, Thus saith Yahweh the King of Israel and his Redeemer Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no Elohim. Then in verse 8, Is there an Eloah beside me? I know not any. So if there is another Elohim besides Yahweh, then Yahweh apparently doesn't know about their existence. And he is God, so he knows everything. Isaiah 45.5 states, I am Yahweh, and there is none else. There is no Elohim beside me. And in Isaiah 45.21 we read, Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh? And there is no Elohim beside me. A just El and a Savior, there is none beside me. I could go on and on, but I think we've made this point abundantly clear. If Asaph had written to the Jewish people a psalm that taught that there were multiple gods like Yahweh, then his psalm would have been rejected and thrown in the trash can. He would have been considered a blasphemer because the Holy Spirit had already clearly revealed to the Jewish people that there was only one Elohim God. This is why some have suggested that this council of the gods must instead refer to the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three persons of one eternal being that is Yahweh. So there is only one Yahweh, but perhaps he can refer to his communion within his persons as a council of Elohim. Now if you want more information on the doctrine of the Trinity, the three-in-one nature of God, check out some of my other videos on that subject. I'll link to them in the description to this video. The problem with this view is obvious when we read just a little further in Psalm 82. In verse 2, Yahweh says to the council, How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Clearly, this cannot be a statement that the persons of Yahweh say to one another, because Yahweh does not judge unjustly. So it seems that we can cross the Trinity interpretation off of our list. But then why did Asaph write that Elohim God stood among the other Elohim if there are no other Elohim and it's not speaking about the Trinity? Well, the answer is that the word Elohim can be used rather flexibly. In fact, the scriptures use the word Elohim or a derivation of it to refer to several different things much like we use the English word God today. We might say that someone who is really strong has God-like strength, or we might say that idols are pagan gods. By that, we don't mean that they are gods in the same way that Yahweh is God. We simply use the word God in a flexible manner. In the same way, the word Elohim was used in Scripture to refer to the one true God, Yahweh, but it was also used in a lesser sense to refer to idols, like in 1 Samuel 5-7, when the Philistines stated that the ark of the Elohi of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us, and upon Dagon our Elohinu. The false god Dagon here was referred to as an Elohim, and that word can also refer in a roundabout way to demons who are worshipped as false gods, Elohim, or to angels, which are called the sons of Elohim in three places in the book of Job, even though they are never actually called Elohim directly, as far as we can tell. But Elohim can also refer to human judges, like in Exodus 21.6, which instructs the people of Israel to bring a servant unto the Elohim, the judges of the city, if that servant wishes of his own free will to continue as a servant. In fact, judges are referred to as Elohim more than once in the Law of Moses because they were to be enacting God's justice on behalf of the people. So since the word Elohim is flexible, this opens up a few more viable interpretations besides the ones we've already examined. Of those, let's first consider interpretation number three, the false gods or demons view. Now, I put these two ideas together because we know that the word Elohim could be used to refer to idols, false gods, and we also know, according to Deuteronomy 32.17, that worshipping idols is equal to worshipping demons, because God says there that the people of Israel would worship idols and sacrifice unto 
devils, not to God, Eloha, to gods, Elohim, whom they knew not. So is it possible that the Elohim in Psalm 82, whom God says are judging unjustly, could be the demons who falsely parade themselves around as gods and are worshipped through idols? While this interpretation certainly has better grounding than the previous two that we've examined, but does it really fit with what Asaph appears to intend to convey under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in this song? Let's look at what Asaph wrote in the next few verses of Psalm 82. In verse 1, God stood among the congregated Elohim and judged them. In verse 2 through 5, we hear what he said to them in that judgment. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand, they walk on in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Reading the judgment that God pronounces on these Elohim, it is admittedly difficult to see how they could possibly be demons. Does God really expect demons to defend the poor and fatherless? Is it a demon's job to deliver the poor and needy? How can it be that demons know not what they are doing and are walking in darkness? The Bible seems to convey to us that demons are well aware of their evil ways. Maybe someone could stretch this text to fit with the condemnation of demons. Perhaps the text means to symbolize how God is angry at those fallen angels Because as angels, they were supposed to be helping mankind, but as demons, they have left that calling. But it doesn't seem to fit very naturally with a judgment of demons. For now, we won't cross this interpretation off of our list, but we will label it as unlikely. If we can't find a better interpretation later, maybe we'll come back to it once we're sure it's our only choice. For now, let's move on to a view that really exists in the same vein as the idol-demon interpretation. That is, the angelic interpretation. This view suggests that heavenly spiritual beings that God created, like the angelic cherubim and seraphim, take part in counseling with God and judging the world. This view is held most notably by Dr. Michael Heiser in his recent book, The Unseen Realm. Now, while I think that Mr. Heiser makes several good points in his book, I have to say that I think his interpretation of Psalm 82 is just untenable. Firstly, and most obviously, because in Psalm 82, God brings a condemnation on the Elohim because they have failed in doing their job. It's difficult to imagine how this could be said of angelic heavenly beings who sit in a council of God in heaven. Furthermore, there's really no good reason to think that Elohim should necessarily refer to an angelic kind of being. As we've noted, the word Elohim refers to many different things in Scripture, but never directly to an angel, only indirectly. Angels are called the sons of Elohim, but never, as far as we can tell for sure, are they actually called Elohim. At least, if there are passages where Elohim refers to angelic beings, it's not clear that angels are the intended interpretation, like in the passage we're discussing right now, Psalm 82. Sure, fallen angels, demons, are called Elohim, but as we discussed, that appears to be because they are masquerading as false gods. They are false Elohim. Are we suggesting that some of God's angelic counsel in heaven are failing to judge righteously and are masquerading around as false Elohim? If so, then we're really back to view number three, the demonic or idolatrous view, which we have already discussed. This leads some to suggest that the council of Elohim in heaven is comprised of all angelic beings, both the righteous ones, the angels, and the fallen ones, the demons. But notice that Asaph's song ends by stating that all of those who are called Elohim and the children of the Most High will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Asaph's conclusion is that all of those being addressed here are bad. They have all failed to judge human beings justly. This seems to rule out both angels and demons. 
Demons are ruled out because scripture never tells us about angelic spirit beings being assigned to judge humans. And angels are doubly ruled out because Asaph tells us that they have all failed. Since God speaks about the failure of the Elohim in Psalm 82, and since there's no definitive reason to think that angels are ever called Elohim directly, I think we have to cross Mr. Heiser's heavenly being interpretation off of our list. Sorry, doctor, I enjoyed your book, but I have to disagree on this. Additionally, there is another impactful piece of evidence that we haven't considered yet that makes these previous four views really impossible and that is found in John chapter 10. Here, it is recorded for us that Jesus was confronted by Jewish leaders about whether or not he was claiming to be the Messiah of Israel. Jesus responded by saying that his miracles proved that he was the Messiah, and also that he was one or equal with the Father in heaven. This statement angered the Jews so much that they took up stones to throw at Jesus and kill him for claiming to be God even though he was a human. Now, Jesus is truly human, but of course we know that he is also truly God as well. That's why Jesus responded to them saying, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God? What we must notice here is that Jesus quoted from Psalm 82 and applied it to the Jewish leadership of the first century. He even told us not only that Asaph was indeed writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but also that God in Psalm 82 was using the word Elohim to refer to human men. The Elohim in Psalm 82 are not divine or spiritual beings. They can't be angels or demons because Jesus was saying that they were humans. How do we know that? Well, first, because Jesus said that God was calling those unto whom the word of God came, gods. Who was the audience of Asaph's song? It wasn't angels, was it? Asaph's psalm was written for the people of Israel, humans. Why would Jesus in John 10 and Asaph in Psalm 82 speak about God calling these beings Elohim if they are Elohim by their very nature? I mean, if spirit beings like angels and demons are a kind of Elohim, then God would just say that they are Elohim, not that he called them Elohim, right? Why would Jesus say that God called them gods if they are Elohim gods already? But also, if you think about it, what would God's purpose be in inspiring Asaph to write a song to the Israelites about God's conversation with the Elohim if they are angelic spirit beings? Why would humans need to know this information? God's conversations with his holy angels are never the focus of any biblical text. Even in texts like the book of Job, chapter 1, or 1 Kings 22, where we are told about things God says to angels, the point of the text is to explain something God was doing on the earth in light of those conversations. If the Elohim in Psalm 82 are spiritual beings, then there seems to be no earthly purpose for the people of Israel to know about God's words to them. But in John chapter 10, we see that Jesus did think that there was a great earthly purpose in Psalm 82. When the Jews wanted to stone him to death for claiming equality with God the Father, Jesus, the man who was calling himself God, defended himself by referring to Psalm 82, saying, and I paraphrase, that the scripture itself calls men gods, and if those men who receive the word of God can be called gods, how much more can the Messiah be called God? In other words, if Jesus is not interpreting Psalm 82 as referring to a time when the word Elohim referred to men, then his entire argument about his own ability to be both God and man in a greater way than those Elohim in Psalm 82 would be senseless. He was saying that if these humans could be called God, then he, though a human, could also be called God all the more, since he is not only human, but is also the Messiah. The entire context is about the outrage of calling a human God. 
But Jesus justified calling himself God, though he was human, using Psalm 82, meaning Jesus taught that Psalm 82 referred to humans. Furthermore, this interpretation makes perfect sense of the end of Psalm 82, which says in verse 7 that these errant Elohim, though they have been called Elohim, will still die like men. Taking this new information from John 10 into account, we can now officially cross off view number three, the idol or demon view. As I see it, we are now left with only two options. Either the Elohim in Psalm 82 are human leaders of the nation of Israel, or they are human leaders of all nations on the earth. Since we've narrowed the interpretation down to humans of some kind, let's examine the difference between these two final views. The Jewish leader's view is a strong interpretation for a couple of reasons. First, because, as we've already noted, Israelite judges were called Elohim in the Mosaic Law. Asaph's Jewish audience would definitely have considered Elohim to be a word that could describe national leaders of their people. Furthermore, this view also agrees very well with God's sovereignty. God doesn't confer with some council of beings before he enacts his plans on the earth. He does as he pleases. As Isaiah 40 verses 13 and 14 states, Who hath directed the spirit of Yahweh? Or being his counselor, hath taught him. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding. God doesn't take counsel from anyone. He judges the counselors, who rule over the people of the earth. God stands in the congregation of the Elohim and judges them. He doesn't get advice from them. The English word council could refer to a group of individuals who congregate to confer with one another on a course of action, like the Council of Elrond in The Lord of the Rings. But the Hebrew word that some translate as council in Psalm 82.1 is Ada which literally means a congregation or an assembly. It's just a group of individuals. The word doesn't signify that they are a council in the sense that they are deliberating together. Psalm 82 simply says that God judges all of these assembled Elohim, not that he gets advice from them. This fits with the human leader's view because it poetically reminds humans that they will stand assembled before God one day to answer for any authority that they may have been given by him over other humans. In fact, the human leaders of Israel view fits incredibly well with the text of Psalm 82. It states that the Elohim were judging unjustly, not defending the poor and fatherless. They were told to do justice to the afflicted and to deliver the poor and needy. They were called Elohim, but would die just like the rest of the men on the earth. Consider also passages like Exodus 4.16, where Moses was like Elohim to Aaron because he would speak to Aaron the words that God spoke to him. Moses stood in the place of God with the authority of God and was therefore called an Elohim in that sense. Again, in Exodus 7, Moses was called an Elohim to Pharaoh since he stood in God's place and spoke God's words to him. That's why human judges are called Elohim in the Mosaic Law, because they were tasked with standing in God's place, speaking God's law, and enacting God's justice for the people. The only problem with the leaders of Israel view is that the text of Psalm 82 says that the failure of these Elohim led to all the foundations of the earth being out of course, and in verse 8, the solution was that God would arise himself and judge all the earth and inherit all nations. This leaves us with our final possible interpretation, which seems to fit like a glove. The Elohim must be the leaders of all nations. In Romans 13, the Apostle Paul wrote, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers or earthly governments, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. For he, that is, the leader who executes judgment in human governments, is the minister of God to thee for good. 
But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. For this cause pay ye tribute, or taxes, also, for they are God's ministers. Now, Romans 13 is not to be interpreted to mean that we should obey the government even when it tells us to disobey God. We ought to obey God rather than men. But Paul is explaining that our default view of government as Christians should be to obey it and submit to it. Why? Because God has ordained governments for the purpose of enacting his justice with his authority. That's why in the law of Moses, judges could be called Elohim because they were standing in the place of God and judging the people of their nation on God's behalf. That is also why God called them Elohim in Psalm 82, but reminded them that they would still die like men. They were not Elohim by nature, but they were called Elohim because they were responsible to carry out the justice of Elohim in his place as leaders of men. Failure to do this would result in their judgment just like the rest of men. God promised to judge the Elohim harshly in Psalm 82 because they were supposed to be standing in God's place with God's authority, enacting God's justice on the earth. But instead, most governmental rulers are corrupt. They judge unjustly. They accept the persons of the wicked. They do not defend the poor and fatherless. They do not do justice to the afflicted and needy. They do not deliver the poor and needy or rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and as a result, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. What do you think? Do you think I dismissed the angels or demons view too quickly? Since they're not called Elohim directly anywhere in scripture, is there any good reason to consider angels to be Elohim? And what about demons? Does God counsel with demons in heaven? And how would you explain the words of Jesus in John 10 that seem to obviously be telling us that Psalm 82 is meant to refer to humans, not spiritual beings? I really do want to hear your thoughts. Join me at the end of the month for a live stream discussion where I'll read and respond to your questions and comments live. Or let me know what you think by typing out your thoughts in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. You can follow The Bible Explained on Facebook, too, at facebook.com forward slash The Bible Explained. Also, I want to give a big thanks to the folks at videobible.com for letting me use their awesome artwork in this video. Check them out on YouTube, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Now, I simply can't leave without reminding you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that all men are sinners and justice demands that we depraved sinners pay for our crime against God for eternity in hell. That's definitely bad news, but the Bible is all about this good news, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Since that penalty has been paid, all that is required of you is that you turn by faith to the Lord and find salvation in Him. If you've never chosen Christ by faith and received this gift of God, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a private message on Facebook and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.